requested that he be permitted to pray before he was executed. There in the presence of his executioners, he kneeled down and in a voice that all could hear, prayed that God would bless and protect his loved ones and care for the little struggling branch that would be left without a leader. As he finished his prayer, he used the words of the Savior when he hung upon the cross and prayed for his executioners, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. With that, the firing squad shot both Brother Monroe and Brother Morales. Some years ago, I went to Mexico to reorganize the state presidency. As I conducted the interviews, I was privileged to become acquainted with one of the descendants of Rafael Monroy. I was very impressed with the depth of this man's testimony and his commitment to the gospel. When I asked him what had happened to the rest of Brother Monroy's descendants, he said that many of them have been on missions and continue faithful in the church. In the early days of the church, other disciples, in addition to Joseph Smith and Iron Smith, also laid down their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The faithfulness of Edward Partridge, the first bishop of the church, is noted in the Doctrine and Covenants. On July 20th, 1833, Edward was sitting at home with his frail wife who had just given birth. Three mobsters burst in and dragged him into the bedlam of the street and then into the square where they had already taken Charles Allen. A mob of 500 demanded through their spokesman that Edward and Charles renounce their faith in the Book of Mormon or leave the county. Edward Partridge responded, if I must suffer for my religion, it is no more than others have done before me. I am not conscious of having injured anyone in this county, and therefore will not consent to leave. I have done nothing to offend anyone. If you abuse me, you are injuring an innocent man. The mob then daubed Edward and Charles from head to foot with hot tar containing pearl ash, a flesh-eating acid, and then they threw feathers that stuck to the burning tar. Prophet Joseph Smith characterized Edward's death a few years later at the age of 46 in these words. He lost his life in consequence of the Missouri persecutions, and he is one of that number whose blood will be required at their hands. Edward Partridge left a legacy that lives on in a large and righteous posterity. For most of us, however, what is required is not to die for the church, but to live for it. For many, living a Christ-like life every day may be even more difficult than laying down one's life. <clears throat> I heard during the time of war that many men were capable of great acts of selflessness, heroism, nobility, without regard to life. But when the war was over, they came home, and they could not bear up under the ordinary daily burdens of living, and became enslaved by tobacco, alcohol, drugs, debauchery, which in the end caused them to forfeit their lives. Some may say, I am a simple person. I have no stature or position. I'm new in the church. My talents and abilities are limited. My contribution is little. Or they may say, I am too old to change. I have already lived my life. Why should I try? It is never too late to change. Discipleship does not come from positions of prominence, wealth, or advanced learning. The disciples of Jesus came from all walks of life. However, discipleship does require us to forsake evil transgression, and enjoy what President Kimball has called the miracle of forgiveness. This can only come through repentance, which means that we forsake sin and resolve each day to be followers of truth and righteousness. As Jesus taught, what manner of men ought you to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. Many think that the price of discipleship is too costly and too burdensome. For some it involves giving up too much, but the cross is not as heavy as it appears to be. 
Through obedience, we acquire much greater strength to carry it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you the rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Our true claim as disciples comes when we say with certainty that his ways have become our ways. The blessings of discipleship are readily available to all who are willing to pay the price. Discipleship brings purpose to our lives so that rather than wander, wander aimlessly, we walk steadily on that straight and narrow way that leads us back to our Heavenly Father. Discipleship brings us comfort in times of sorrow, peace of conscience, and joy in service, all of which will help us to be more like Jesus. Through discipleship of the Savior, we come to know and believe in our hearts and minds the saving principles and ordinances of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Through our discipleship, we come to appreciate the profound mission of the Prophet Joseph Smith in restoring those saving principles in our time. We rejoice that the keys of the priesthood and its authority have been passed down through the presence of the Church from the Prophet Joseph to our present Prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley. We are grateful that in our discipleship of the Savior, we come to enjoy his promise of peace in this world with contentment, happiness, and fulfillment. Through our discipleship, we are able to receive the spiritual strength that we need to deal with the challenges of life. One of the greatest blessings of life and eternity is to be counted as one of the devoted disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a profound testimony of this truth, to which I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.